Rob, thanks, Richard. Um, and so, yeah, I'm going to jump right in because I, I do want to make sure that we cover the material and also um, have that little bit of time at the end for questions. Uh, happy Equinox, by the way, everybody. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, you know, kind of like Rob was just uh, describing, my goal today was to just kind of um, give some additional thoughts and insights. Those of you that have seen some of the material I've presented before, there'll be some new material here. Um, those who haven't um, heard any of the information that I've presented on neuromeditation, I do want to give a, a, a quick overview. So um, those of you who have heard some of this before, just hang in there for just a sec. Um, by way of background, I just wanted to kind of let everyone know where this is coming from. And uh, so, you know, my background in neurofeedback and in meditation both really got started in the late 90s. Um, seriously, they both got seriously started in the late 90s and um, kind of existed on parallel paths for quite a while. And, um, you know, I had heard, you know, rumblings of people trying to um, combine the two things and then was fortunate enough to um, attend uh, one of Richard's workshops uh, on the topic of neuromeditation. In 2008, it was through Stress Therapy Solutions. And that was really a great introduction for me to kind of how you can combine these things in some uh, powerful ways. And so um, fast forward a little bit and um, over the last really three years in particular, a little bit longer than that, but really the last three years, we've really been taking a lot of the research literature that's out there on the brain and meditation and applying that, kind of moving it forward, and so kind of adding to um, some of the work that, that Richard uh, really pioneered. So um, uh, for those of you that, uh, again, you know, haven't kind of heard my spiel before, uh, it's important for me to kind of uh, articulate that the way that we're thinking about, the way that I'm thinking about and talking about meditation in this context is really as mental training. And it's not to take anything away from the spiritual elements of meditation, but really just to make the point that you can engage in meditation without it being spiritual. It doesn't have to be that. And so this really opens it up to um, many more audiences. Uh, and so I think this is really an important reason why meditation in, in particular and mindfulness specifically have become such huge cultural um, phenomena you know, over the last 10, 15 years is because of this idea that it can be a secular practice. You don't have to believe anything in particular to benefit from these practices. And that's the approach that we're taking just to make it really accessible for folks. The definition that I tend to use for meditation is uh, that meditation is a systematic mental training designed to challenge habits of attending, thinking, feeling, and perceiving. And, you know, th th there, there are some pieces of this definition that I, I, I keep kind of playing with, but overall, I kind of like this as a definition. It really, because really for me, what it is kind of suggesting is that what a lot of meditation is about is looking at yourself and challenging the ways that the mind automatically and habitually processes information which largely that's what meditation is. You're, you're challenging those, uh, the normal, if you wanna call it normal, normal in air quotes, uh, ways that we move through the world and that our mind engages and perceives and thinks. And of course, those are a lot of the ways that we get ourselves in trouble is by the way that the mind is perceiving things, how we're paying attention, what we're paying attention to. And so meditation becomes a powerful tool to break out of those old patterns. <clears throat> so in general, the four styles of neuromeditation that we have been working with, we've got some, some new ones that we're kind of playing with as well, but the, the four solid ones that we have are really um, based solidly in the research literature. So it, what, we didn't make these things up. And you see there's a couple of citations there that are um, some of the bigger, more important articles where we pulled a lot of this information. Um, essentially what we have been able to do by looking at some of the um, research that's out there is identify that there are um, really about four styles of meditation based on how you're using your attention, what your intention is, what brain waves are in, involved, and in what brain regions. And so if you take those four things and really kind of um, 
zone them in in specific ways, they look very much like these uh, identifiable styles of meditation. So the, the, the names that we have been using, really just to make life kind of simple for folks, um, are focus, mindfulness, open heart, and quiet mind. And we chose that language because it's pretty straightforward and people can really quickly get an idea of what that meditation style is about. And so uh, today, what I wanted to do was, because of course, you know, with, you know, having 45 minutes or so, we're not gonna be able to cover all of this material, not even close. Um, but I wanted to, to talk a little bit about today, today about focus and mindfulness, what's going on in the brain, some of the new ways we're starting to think about mindfulness in particular, um, and then at the end, I will touch on open heart and quiet mind, but from the um, more from an angle of using transcranial direct current stimulation. Um, and so that's another angle that we're going in. So not just using neurofeedback, but using other uh, technology. So we're kind of moving into a broader kind of technology assisted meditation using audio visual entrainment, transcranial direct photobiomodulation all of these things in conjunction with meditation styles. So I wanted to at least bring that up for a moment at the end. So to get started, I, I wanna talk a little bit about focus and um, the focus style of meditation and really as a way to help us then look at mindfulness because the mindfulness material that I wanna talk about is really interesting and it's a little bit confusing, which is why I wanted to come back to it. Those of you who were at the last webinar that we did um, I probably said very clearly that, you know, the mindfulness area is kind of messy and it's really uh, challenging to know how to create a neurofeedback protocol that works really well with that. And I think we're getting better. And so I wanted to share some of that information. Anyway, starting with focus. So a focus meditation is really any kind of a concentration practice. So any kind of a practice where you are holding your attention on a single target so the breath is a very common target, or it could be a mantra, you know, a word or a phrase that you repeat over and over as a way to hold your attention on one thing. It could be an, uh, an image, like an image of the Buddha that you hold in your mind, or it could be something in front of you. Uh, it, it really doesn't matter from this perspective, but as long as your, your goal, your intention, is to hold your attention on a single thing. And of course, what happens is you hold your attention on that single object, let's say the breath, and after a few moments, the mind gets distracted, it wanders off. Your job is to recognize that it wandered off and gently, patiently, uh, lovingly escort it back to the target. So that's the basic idea. Now, when you look at some of the research literature that's out there, one of the things that shows up very consistently is that these practices actually increase fast brainwave activity. In particular, what you see in the research is beta two and gamma uh, increasing as a result of these practices. So this goes back to Travis and Shear's article that I cited on that slide, uh, either the slide before that or the one, I can't remember, was it just last one? Yeah. So the Travis and Shear article down there on the bottom, uh, focused attention, open monitoring, and automatic self-transcending. Uh, categories to organize meditations from Vedic, Buddhist, and Chinese traditions. So what they did in that article was really, it was kind of a review article, and grabbing all of the research they could find uh, in each of these categories. And this is what they found, is that this increase of fast brain waves. So one of the, the things that we've been really paying attention to is how can we identify what concerns or goals might fit really well with each of the meditation styles. And so for a focus style of meditation, uh, you know, if your goals are to improve your focus or your attention, your executive functioning, brain brightening kinds of things, this is a really good match. And you'll see why in just a moment. It's also a good match for ADHD. Um, for Again, for kind of obvious reasons. You know, we know the brain is very plastic, it's adaptable <clears throat> and you know, if you want to get better at paying attention, if you want to get better at inhibiting your impulses, uh, one of the best ways to get good at that is to practice it. And that's literally what you're doing in this kind of a meditation. You're learning to sustain your attention. You're learning to uh, uh, shift your attention away from distractions and, you know, and um, have some mental control. 
So I wanted to direct our attention to this article in particular. It's a, it's a very useful article in terms of thinking about this style of meditation. So mind wandering and attention during a focused meditation. Uh, a fine grained temporal analysis of fluctuating cognitive states. And essentially what they did was they took a group of meditators, I think they had 14 or something like that, of meditators and they stuck up in an fMRI which we can discuss that later about how valid meditating in an fMRI machine is, but um, they stuck them in the machine and then had them press a button essentially when they were aware of mind wandering. And here's um, kind of the model that they proposed. They were thinking that what's likely to happen is that if you're engaged in some level of attention, so either sustaining your attention or uh, you know, having an awareness of mind wandering, which obviously involves some sort of attention, uh, and returning your attention back, that all of those things would activate the attention networks. Whereas when the mind wanders and you're thinking about who knows what, anything but your breath, uh, that that would be uh, activation in the default mode network. So this was their hypothesis for this study. And, um, and it's actually what they found, although it gets a little bit more fine-tuned. And so I found this graphic that really lays it out really nicely. And th so there's these four parts of the meditation practice, of the focus practice. So if you actually start down at number four on the bottom of the screen, where it says sustaining focus, let's imagine that we're starting here. So you're watching the breath, you're holding your attention on the breath, nothing else exists. So when this is happening, really the region that lights up is the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. This really gets engaged. Um, and so that's kind of the main piece when you're just holding your attention on that single object. Then of course, if we go up to number one, the mind wanders, right? You lose track of this. And when the mind wanders, you can see there's a whole bunch of stuff that lights up because these are all connected to the default mode network. So of course, the largest areas that lit up were like the posterior cingulate and the precuneus, um, which are often considered the hub, uh, the main hub of the default mode network. And we'll talk about the default mode network in, more in just a moment, but you know, when that lights up, it really is involved in some level of self-referencing. You're thinking about yourself or you're thinking about something in reference to yourself. So it makes sense that that is going to be connected to mind wandering, because if you're not focused on your breath, you're probably thinking about yourself or something in re reference to yourself. So then we go to number two, distraction awareness. Right, so this is in the other slide they were calling awareness of mind wandering. So you all of a sudden you become aware that you're not paying attention to what you were supposed to be paying attention to. Um, now this is very interesting because now it, the, the salience network kicks in here. So in particular the anterior insula and the anterior cingulate cortex. Um, and if you kind of read under there on number two, I don't know if you can see it on your screen or not, the salience network which includes uh, the regions we just talked about, underlies the meditator's awareness of the distraction. Once cognizant that the mind has roved, the volunteer pushes a button to let researchers know what happened. Okay. And then after you're aware that your mind wandered, you have to shift the attention back. And so here we've got that dorsolateral prefrontal cortex getting back in, engaged, uh, along with the inferior parietal lobe um, is part of that process as well. So you can kind of see that a, a focused meditation, there's, there's a, a fair amount going on here. Um, there's at least three brain networks going uh, involved. So the default mode, the salience, the executive network. Um, but we can simplify it a little bit for our purposes. So um, here's kind of the way that it makes a lot of sense and the way that we've been kind of working with it with neurofeedback um, is you know, looking at that dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So we know that that is going to be engaged um, when the person is focused. So this is very important. If you're doing a, a focused meditation, this is critical. Um, you have to have this as part of the game. And um, so this is gonna be our primary uh, place where we put attention in terms of uh, electrode placement and that sort of thing. So, you know, you, you could theoretically, you know, F3 or F4 would be a pretty good uh, location, although, you know, it's interesting, I, uh, Thompson and Thompson, and I've seen it in other charts as well, really talk about F4 as being more involved in both selective and sustained attention. And so we've actually had a lot of success 
um, with that placement with this type of a meditation. Um, now, the other area that's kind of interesting and is also involved in sustaining attention is the anterior cingulate cortex. So we've kind of worked with both of these. Um, and honestly, you know, I'm not sure which one's better. I think there's some individual difference. And this is, um, this is actually important to bring up in terms of this idea of neuromeditation because with these types of meditation styles, what we're finding is that there is some variability, not only in terms of locations that we really wanna target or which ones are gonna work better for a specific individual, but also which brain waves uh, we're targeting. And so we'll get into that. I think that's the next slide, maybe. Let's see. Oh, actually, I talk about the default mode network first. So let me back up one more step. So here we're saying, you know, the executive network and particularly uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and the anterior cingulate, these are really key regions for sustaining attention, sustaining focus, uh, and that element of a focus meditation. The other part that we're really concerned about is the mind wandering. The, the stuff in the middle, we're less worried about uh, for the purposes of a neuro meditation. Um, but we have to have, are you focused? So basically, getting engagement in these regions is telling us, are you focused on something? Now, we don't know what you're focused on. Just because this is engaged, that doesn't really tell us what you're focused on. It just says that you're focused. So the default mode network and watching engagement here and monitoring that, this really starts to give us an idea of what you're paying attention to. So are you focused? Yes, but what are you focused on? So if the default mode network is activated, um, you're probably thinking about yourself and you're probably not engaged in the meditation the way that we want. So we don't want the default mode network on. So we want those regions in the frontal lobe activated. We want these guys, you know, the default mode network to be quiet. Um, and, and so there's different ways that that can be accomplished, obviously, because we're talking about, you know, essentially activating and inhibiting. And, you know, you can use different brainwave frequencies to accomplish that task. That's where some of the individual variability comes in. So here's, here's what we were just discussing, just kind of laid out. So for this kind of a, if you're using neurofeedback with this, um, the uh, anterior cingulate and or the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, you're gonna be rewarding this in some way. You're gonna be activate, rewarding activation in these areas. Um, so probably something like gamma, that tends to work really well. Um, inhibiting, now this one's a little bit in, more tricky because we don't want there to be activation in the precuneus or the posterior cingulate. Well, so you could look at that a couple ways. Um, initially, what we did was we actually rewarded alpha one back there as a way to kind of reward that area being a little more quiet. Um, but now we're actually finding that for some people, that's not as successful as inhibiting something like beta um, or even gamma, really. Um, so inhibiting the fast activity. So you could approach it either way. And again, there's some individual variability. So I wanted to bring up, um, some of you may have heard me talk about that material before. Um, the rest of this, probably you haven't. Um, this idea, you know, I, I brought it up at the beginning that a focus meditation is particularly, might be particularly good for things like improving attention. And, uh, you know, that makes sense, but is there any evidence for that? And there is. I mean, I just grabbed a handful of uh, citations here. Um, one of the things that stands out when you look at the research literature on meditation uh, and cognitive improvement is that it's kind of all over the board in terms of the research. Uh, one of the things that stood out to me was that if you're looking at shorter term models of the impact of meditation, so if you're looking at like a six week intervention or an eight week or a 10 week, um, the results are kind of mixed. They don't always show that the new meditators have improved significantly on any kind of cognitive function. Some of them do. And in fact, the very first one listed here, um, you know, was able to show improved attention and decreased distractibility after an eight week, you know, MBSR class, mindfulness-based stress reduction. So there is data that suggests that even a short term model can work but it, it, it doesn't always show that. However, when you look at the long-term models, so 
comparing long-term meditators to novice meditators, uh, I don't want to say 100% because I'm sure there's something that contradicts me out there, but the vast majority of that research supports the idea that experienced meditators have more efficient brains, uh, faster brains, reaction time, P300, um, you know, uh, memory, attention, you know, re reduced distractibility, all of those kinds of things, uh, advanced meditators or experienced meditators score better than novice meditators. So there is some solid evidence that this can assist the functioning of the frontal lobes, which makes sense. You're activating the frontal lobes. Um, I, I want to draw your attention to the fourth bullet on this slide because this study was, was kind of cool because they compared focused attention meditators to a loving kindness meditate meditation, looking for changes in a continuous performance test. And what they found was that the focused attention meditators improved significantly on omissions, meaning they were missing fewer things, they were improving their attention, whereas the loving kindness meditators did not show any changes. So even though it's only one study, it's kind of making our point that, um, or one of the points anyway, that the type of meditation you're doing may be really important for what your goal is, that all meditations are not the same. They don't do the same things. They don't activate the brain the same way. So why would they have the same impact? So this is a really good study that kind of makes that point. I figured you all would appreciate this slide. Um, uh, looking at changes in theta beta ratios. So I, I've only found three studies. There's probably more now, but um, these are the only three that I've identified where they looked at changes in theta beta ratios after meditation practices. And the first one, um, you know, so after an eight week mindfulness based cognitive therapy intervention, bipolar patients showed significantly decreased theta beta in frontal and cingulate cortices which would probably be a really great place for that to happen. Uh, the second bullet, after three months of transcendental meditation, ADHD students showed decreased theta beta, increased letter fluency, improved ADHD symptoms. Now, TM's an interesting one. I don't want to get sidetracked on this too much, but transcendental meditation technically it doesn't fit into a focus category. Um, it fits into a quiet mind category. However, the beginning part of, of a transcendental meditation is a focused practice. It's essentially a focused practice that transitions into a quiet mind practice. So typically you're gonna start with focusing on a mantra. And so that is a focused practice. But then as the, um, as the meditation progresses, you kind of shift into focusing on that mantra to letting that go. So then it becomes something a little different. Anyway, the one I, that's really uh, interesting to me is this last one. With Soto Zen meditators, more consistent than long-term practice was associated with increased theta beta and a decrease in the alpha peak frequency. So those are both indications of slowing. And so this is interesting to me because again, it kind of makes our point that uh, you know all meditations are not the same. They do different things to the brain. And so it's a way for us to be able to, to begin to be more thoughtful about which meditation might be good for certain individuals. So looking at that last one, if somebody already has a really high theta beta ratio and ADHD symptoms, perhaps doing uh, Soto Zen meditations is not the best choice, if you see what I'm saying. Okay, so that's kind of our introduction to focus. So now I wanna shift over to mindfulness and so we can kind of compare and contrast a little bit and talk a, a little bit about how we're starting to, to figure out some fine tuning with uh, the mindfulness. So now this term, you know, is being kind of thrown around all over the place now, um, which is, you know, is great that it's, it's becoming more common and more popular. However, at the same time, um, we're losing some specificity with what this actually means. Um, so I just want to clarify what I'm talking about when I use this term and, uh, and sort of identifying that I'm talking about a very specific way of meditation, a very specific way of paying attention. Um, so it's a non-judgmental awareness of the present moment. So you're essentially observing what's happening in the present moment without attachment. So you're not pushing anything away. 
that you don't like. You're not grasping for anything that you do like. You're simply allowing things to be as they are and letting them go. So you can see just in that description how it's quite different than a focus practice. They can certainly go well together, but they're different. Um, now, I've got a whole bunch of brainwave stuff listed here. This is where things get messy. Um, and I'm gonna tease all this out, so don't worry about it right now. I'm gonna spell it all out for you here in a moment. So this practice seems to be particularly good um, to help people experience uh, an inner calmness, to be able to distance themselves from their thoughts and feelings and sensations. And in that way, it's a really excellent match for stress and anxiety. Because one of the problems with stress and anxiety, of course, is that you are, you're attached to your thoughts and your feelings and your bodily sensations. You know, in fact, if you think about what worry is, you know, worry could be thought of as holding on to a certain thought or a certain feeling, sort of repeating that thought over and over and over. Um, and so with mindfulness, you're learning to step back out of that, to be more of an observer and to not attach and to let it go. So you can see where mindfulness is a good counterbalance to what's going on with stress and anxiety. Now, I wanna go back to the slide. It's the exact same slide we looked at with focus. Um, but I wanna zone in on one aspect of this that we kind of uh, neglected last time. Uh, so if you go up to the top, the top little brain, the distraction awareness or awareness of mind wandering, and we talked about that that was the salience network, that that's what was involved there, the insula and the anterior cingulate. And uh, this is really interesting because that moment of awareness of mind wandering, that's actually a mindfulness moment, if you think about that for a moment. You know, your mind wanders, you're in storyland, you're thinking about lunch or what you have to do later or what you watched on Netflix last night, and all of a sudden, you're aware that that's what you're doing. So in that moment, that is mindfulness. You're aware of what the mind is doing in that moment. So we can see that the salience network may be an important element in a mindfulness practice. So let's draw this out just a little bit more. Um, so, um, you know, the insula, of course the insula and the ACC uh, are often co-activated. They kind of seem to work together frequently, and it makes sense because uh, they're both, you know, heavy hitters in terms of the salience network. So some of the things that that go on with the insula in particular and mindfulness, uh, interoception, so awareness of the body's internal and visceral states, including respiration, heart rate. So again, if you're aware of what's happening in your body in the moment, it's going to involve the insula. Emotional self-awareness. That involves the insula, metacognitive awareness. So again, I just mentioned, you know, that mindfulness is really about this awareness of thoughts, feelings, and body sensations. And we just covered all three of those. Um, and then at the bottom here, you know, meditation research reporting differences in the insula focus almost exclusively on practices that emphasize body awareness, including attention to body posture, respiration, ambient tactile sensations, et cetera. And there's lots of citations there. So this is something that we, we, you know, we have quite a bit of data for to show that this region is particularly uh, important for mindfulness. So we're gonna hold on to this. So we know the insula is gonna be activated. So hang, hang on to that. And let's shift up again to the ACC because we talked about that the insula and the anterior cingulate both seem to be engaged together in a lot of these tasks. So another thing that you see frequently in the research is that, uh, yes, the ACC is involved, but the activation there is interesting because it's actually um, something called frontal midline theta. So it's kind of a special case of theta. Um, uh, and that's, you know, frontal midline theta, well, where is it coming from? Well, it's coming from the anterior cingulate. Um, and this is a special kind of theta because uh, it's not just necessarily just spaced out kind of theta. It's, you know, it's task related. So it's related to orienting, to attention, to memory, to affective processing. So again, you could see how that might connect to a mindfulness practice. So we've got activation of the insula, and then we've also got this kind of frontal midline theta stuff happening in the anterior cingulate. 
here's just an example of a study that, that showed that very clearly. Um, in this particular study, they were looking at um, practitioners of Sahaja Yoga, and they were doing a, a meditation that they, they described as thoughtless awareness. And uh, again, it's interesting because you'll hear different terms used that are really describing a similar practice. Um, so in this case, instead of calling it mindfulness, they were calling it thoughtless awareness. So what they found in the study, long-term meditators had increased theta power during meditation that reflected both general theta and frontal midline theta. Short-term meditators did not show these patterns. So this is important, and you see this a lot in the research, is that when you're comparing novice meditators to experienced meditators, they don't show the same brain patterns, which makes sense. The experienced meditators actually know how to engage. Uh, with the meditation the way it's designed. Short-term meditators, maybe not so much. So this is another place where thinking about using neurofeedback to assist the process can be super helpful because we can help those novices find that sweet spot of where to hold their attention uh, in a way that they may not be able to without that additional support. So a couple of other things just related to this idea of theta and how it relates to mindfulness and how it relates to um, anxiety. So several bullets here. Persons demonstrating greater, greater theta activity report less anxiety. Mindfulness forms of meditation increase theta. Increases in frontal theta during meditation are associated with decreases in both short and long-term anxiety, et cetera, et cetera. So again, we've got some pretty solid evidence that that this might be important as well. So I wanted to bring up another study here uh, to look at the default mode network. So this is this is the part, that those first two things we've talked about, those are fairly straightforward. And I think, you know, for most people they make sense. Uh, it makes sense in terms of neurofeedback. Um, but then when we start looking at the default mode network, this is where things get a little weird. And by weird, what I mean is that uh, in some research you will see uh, that the default mode network becomes deactivated during a mindfulness practice. And then you will also see research that shows the default mode network becomes activated during a mindfulness practice. So this is confusing. And this is where I've been having some trouble over the last couple of years trying to sort all of this. So I'm going to try and walk you through my current understanding. And uh, hopefully it will make sense to you. So in this particular study, uh, this is one of uh, Judson Brewer's um, research um, that he's done looking at the default mode network in a uh, fMRI while people are engaged in meditation. And uh, what they found in the study was that both novice and experienced meditators demonstrated decreased posterior cingulate cortex activity during effortless awareness. And they were measuring gamma is what they were looking at. So during a, what we would consider a, um, mindfulness practice, there was decreased activity in the posterior cingulate for both groups. And both groups were also able to control the signal uh, of the, in the posterior cingulate by practicing this meditation. So this is actually a great little study showing that neuromeditation uh, works, that people can do it. We don't need proof of that because we sort of get that. But uh, it's nice to have some research literature supporting this idea, even if it was in an fMRI. So here's another one of Judson Brewer's articles that's kind of extending this further. And what they found in this article was that, uh, you can see the name of the article, Effortless Awareness, Using Real-Time Neurofeedback to Investigate Correlates of Posterior Cingulate Cortex Activity and Meditator Self-Report. So essentially what they were doing was uh, cueing these meditators and asking them what was going on internally during certain uh, uh, activation states of the posterior cingulate and then kind of mapping this out. And so what they found was that <clears throat> if the posterior cingulate was active, you can see kind of their little chart here. Uh, it was mostly linked to things like distracted awareness, controlling, efforting, uh, interpreting, distraction, et cetera. But the one thing that I'll bring up here that I think is important for us to, to understand why sometimes there is activation versus deactivation is if you look under efforting, Efforting is an interesting word, and usually in meditation, we don't want to effort. Uh, we don't want to over-effort, but it does take some level of effort. You have to direct your attention in a specific way. 
And you see under efforting, it's got physical sensations, visual objects, auditory objects, mental objects. So, you know, you're, you're, you're efforting in terms of what you're paying attention to and how you're paying attention. If you look at the lower chart where it says deactivation, here we've got, you know, undistracted awareness, effortless doing, non-efforting, um, and some of the same kinds of things, right? So you can sort of pay attention to uh, your sensory experience moment to moment, either using effort or not using effort. Well, what is, okay, so what, is that, what does that look like? What does that mean exactly? We'll come back to that in just a moment. So both of those, if you kind of look at, the, at what we just covered, it sort of suggests that the, we, would, we would want a decrease of activation in the default mode network during mindfulness. But then here's some of that research I was talking about that's contradictory. So, you know, increased gamma over the parietal occipital electrodes during open monitoring Vipassana meditation, which would definitely be considered mindfulness. Uh, increased gamma over posterior electrodes during, here's another one. Um, so, you know, there, there's several research articles showing that there's an increase of gamma during these practices. Um, so what, how do we make sense out of this? Um, I've got one more piece of data that I want to discuss, and then I'm going to try and pull it all together. We'll see how we, we'll see how that goes. So one more study here uh, by Farb, uh, the name of it's Attending to the Present. Mindfulness meditation reveals distinct neural modes of self-reference. So in this uh, research, what they were really comparing was what they are talking about as a narrative focus versus an experiential focus. So a narrative focus is a cognitive elaboration of mental events. So I think of this as storytelling. This is when the mind engages with some kind of uh, internal whatever, thought process, and you just kind of run with it. And you kind of create a story out of this. And you can see, so certainly there's some, um, you know, uh, frontal areas that gets activated, but a lot of it is this left side of the brain, the linguistic semantic network. So the left side of the brain that's, you know, you're sort of talking to yourself in words, you're making up a story. So that's what gets involved with a narrative focus. The experiential focus is the inhibition of cognitive elaboration on, on any one mental event in favor of broadly attending to more temporally proximal sensory objects. So basically, it's mindfulness, right? This is what we were just describing. So with this, you have a deactivation of that narrative locations and a shift toward right lateralized networks. Um, so it, this is very interesting um, that, you know, we have sort of additional data showing that there's actually kind of this left-right uh, hemisphere um, with different brain regions that might be important as well. So how do we make sense out of all of this? And, and you can see why it was a bit confusing trying to figure out um, what, what do we do with this? Hey, we okay? All right, Somebody, somebody's mic's on. I was just making sure we're okay. Um, all right, so let's tie this all together. So essentially, the, the conclusion I've come to is that there's kind of two different forms of mindfulness that we might pay attention to uh, using uh, neurofeedback or other technologies. So we can think of one as a thoughtless awareness, if that's a, a good term, and that might include things like the effortless awareness, the choiceless awareness, experiential focus, these different terms that some of the research has used. And in this, uh, to me, what it looks like is that this is where we're going to have that frontal midline theta uh, activated and a decrease of gamma in the default mode network. So this is where there's the non-efforting uh, and you're just very softly uh, allowing thought forms, sensations to kind of move in and out of your awareness. The other one that's considered mindfulness, I think I'm, I'm calling thoughtful awareness. So this would be more like a body scan um, where you are using some effort. You're intentionally shifting your attention to specific body parts. So a progressive muscle relaxation or even healing imagery in the body or, or going through the chakras where there is some effort involved. You're directing your attention. Um, so um, with this one, it seems important to uh, look at things like perhaps the, the insula, uh, especially the right insula. 
and activating the default mode network because you are looking at yourself and you're looking at yourself in an intentional way. So <clears throat> this is the way that we're starting to, to kind of work with these. And so far, we're having pretty good success by dividing this up this way and then really um, engaging people with the specific meditation that kind of matches uh, these protocols. All right, I'm gonna quickly go through this. I know we've only got a couple of minutes. It's amazing how fast time goes. Uh, and I feel like I'm talking as fast as I can too. Uh, so next time I should knock out about 10 slides. Anyway, most of you are probably familiar with transcranial direct current. Um, it, it's a fairly simple technology and I, I just put up the brain driver here just for those of you who aren't familiar with kind of what these things look like. You know, you can buy that little set there for 150 bucks or something. Uh, essentially, it's a low intensity direct electrical current that is running through two electrodes. Uh, one is an A node and is excitatory. So you put that somewhere on the head and the area below that, the, um, the brain cells below that um, are, become more likely to fire. You're, you're actually not turning them on, but you're making them more likely to fire. The cathode is the other side of that, and the area below that, you're making those brain cells less likely to fire. So this is being used in all kinds of research and uh, uh, clinical work with really good results. And so I've been kind of working with this and starting to, to apply this to meditation styles. And so the first one, uh, I'm just gonna talk quickly about both of these, the open heart um, style um, you know, is really about engaging in positive emotional states. And so this one is a kind of a, a no-brainer, uh, no pun intended, in terms of thinking about this because there's a lot of research showing how a specific placement with the uh, transcranial direct current is good for depression. Um, so particularly putting the A node, the activating part, over on the left frontal area, F3, FP1, somewhere in that vicinity, and then putting the cathode uh, the deactivating one over on the right side. And again, there's lots of research showing that this particular placement is very helpful with depression. So basically what I've been doing is layering this with an open heart meditation, which does the same thing. Open heart meditations also shift activity over to the left frontal area uh, away from the right. So basically, you know, figuring out ways to kind of combine uh, strategies for the same end. And then the last one, quiet mind, this one is exactly what it sounds like. This is the stereotype of meditation where there's nothing going on. Your mind is basically a big blank slate as much as possible, um, at least for moments. And that's important is that mostly this happens in moments. It's not like you're holding on to this for any extended period. Um, so for this one, one of the ways we've been um, combining this with the TDCS is to stick it right on the hub of the default mode network, uh, actually to put the cathode there, which is decreasing activity. Um, and then we don't put the, the A node anywhere because I don't really wanna activate anything on the brain with this particular meditation. So you know, we'll stick the A node on the shoulder somewhere, kind of get it out of the way and put the cathode at PZ, um, right on top of the, the posterior cingulate or the uh, percunius to try and quiet those regions down. Again, but this is happening in conjunction with a meditation that's also uh, kind of attempting to do the same thing. So, holy smokes. Um, if you're interested in more, you know, uh, the book's out there, um, so you can check that out, it's on Amazon. Um, we just finished a, a, a workshop here a few weeks ago, so um, working on getting some more scheduled uh, here in Eugene, Oregon, which is where I'm based, and then um, we're gonna set one up in San Francisco coming up soon. Uh, probably this summer. And um, we have one in uh, Majorca coming up in just a few weeks, working with Thomas Feiner and his group um, out there. Uh, that's it. I, hopefully I have at least a few minutes for questions. All right. Hey, thanks.